abstract expressionism tends to get a bad rap when it comes to people looking at art. In fact, this is the movement that most people will point to when they argue that modern art is somehow garbage, leaving out all of the art that's happened since, oh, I don't know, 1945, for the last 50, 60, 70 years. But leaving that aside, let's look at abstract expressionism. Now, this will come about coming out of the 1940s as the art world shifts to New York. Why does it shift to New York from Paris and Europe in general? Well, of course, Paris and Europe in general are in ruins. They have fallen victim to World War II, whereas the United States is fairly unscathed, leaving aside a small oil refinery, parts of the Aleutian Islands, uh, minor issues, uh, Pearl Harbor, that sort of thing, but mainland America is unscathed and made a huge profit through World War II, meaning that there's money and there's no concern about rebuilding. So, with that in mind, let's look at abstract expressionism. And this is really a term that's applied to new forms of abstract art. They're going to be developed by people such as Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, and de Kooning. It's going to come about primarily in the 1940s and 1950s, and we're going to see a lot of gestural brushstrokes, a lot of spontaneity. There's a lot of energy going into these pieces, and part of the idea is based on a man by the name of Clement Greenberg's idea. He's a major New York art critic, and he believed that artists should focus on the properties exclusive to their medium. What does that mean? That means if I'm a painter, I want to deal with those properties that makes paint unique. If I'm a wood sculptor, I want to deal with the issues in wood that make them unique. This is very similar to Soviet constructivist ideas. This is similar to other ideas that we've seen along the way. This is also going to be the first major American avant-garde movement that emerges in New York, primarily with Jackson Pollock. At least he's the one that we kind of credit with a lot of this. And what we see is work that is abstract, but tends to express some element of the artist's state of mind. It's really often meant to be seen from outside the formal confines of art historical interpretation. In other words, I should not be explaining to you what a piece means. It's really up to you, and it changes day to day, hour to hour, but we'll get to that. It's meant to be viewed and interpreted by the outsider or the artist, possibly. It sort of depends how the artist plays things. Sometimes the artist wants to get more involved in interpretation. Sometimes they're very hands-off. So let's deal with that issue of, well, abstract expressionism. Now, these works are meant to be understood in any context or at times without context. They also tend to be very large, as we see. The sort of thing that if you stand six feet away from it, you're going to have it take up all of your peripheral vision, which leads to the question of interpretation. How do you handle a painting like this? Whether it's gestural or chromatic, and we'll get to that in a second, you kind of deal with it the same way. You sit in front of it or you stand in front of it. And what you do is you watch your train of thought. We all have a train of thought running through all the time. Uh, you know, worrying about issues of self-consciousness, worrying about whether you'll get a date with that other person, whether you're going to pass that class or whatever the situation may be. Now, as you stand in front of this painting, and you need to stand in front of it for probably three to five minutes to really get the impact, there are two things that's going to, that is generally going to happen. First of all, your eyes, especially with something like a Pollock, are going to start playing tricks on you. You're going to see things that aren't there. A tiger, a cloud, a plant, a member of whatever horrible childhood band you used to watch, like the Wiggles, whatever it happens to be. The second thing that's going to happen is you will notice that that train of thought is going to change. And it's that change in, tra in your train of thought that really lends itself to interpretation. You might find yourself getting angrier or happier. You might see that you start thinking about different things. 
So all that abstract expressionism is doing is handing you a mirror. And this works particularly well in the 1940s and 1950s when people are very, very optimistic in the United States, which means they're more willing to look inside themselves. Whereas today with an economy that is kind of rough at times, depending where you are in the socioeconomic scale, people tend to want more escapism, which is why we see more fantasy TV and all of that sort of thing. Now, I said there are two forms of abstract expressionism. There's gestural abstraction, also known as action painting. And what we see here is a focus on the shape and form of energetically applied pigment or paint. It's more capturing the movements of the artist than anything else. It's kind of like watching a dance recorded in pigment. And that's really what you're seeing. You're seeing the artist move around the canvas and apply that paint. Now, that may or may not change the way you interpret it. You can read it as a record of movement. That is a possibility, although that isn't the common form of interpretation. Now, we will also see chromatic abstraction or color field. This is going to be by artists like Rothko, and we'll get into sort of second generation color field as well. And here they're relying on colors, emotional resonance. In other words, different colors will bring out different emotions. We've known this for a hundred years at this point, by the time we get to the end of World War II. And you know this if you've ever painted a home or your parents did. You know that a room that is deep blue is going to be calming, is going to be a very peaceful place to be. Bright red might not be the best approach if you're, you know, not running a New Orleans brothel. But we know that color has emotional resonance, so they're going to play on that. And we're going to see that used quite a bit. But either way, these are large paintings, they're interpreted by the viewer, and they act as a mirror for us to explore our own thoughts and ideas in a specific moment.